um, you know, then you have to mitigate that. And so it's it's always balancing risk benefit. What's the what's the benefit of doing this work versus what's the risk? And I think that's really where personalized medicine comes in because you can do genetic analysis and figure out, you know, who may be susceptible to oxalates and prone to kidney stones or and then you know address it accordingly. Thank you. Um so Dr. Montgomery, um you mentioned stents potentially causing a problem in, in a more stable blockage. Um, a number of years ago, and actually one of our panels, uh, I think there, I think it was between Dr. Uh, Kim Williams and Dr. Uh, T. Colin Campbell, where they, um, Dr. Campbell was was basically saying that stents and uh, and statins really didn't have a, a long term beneficial effect, um, and Dr. Kim Williams was saying no, that that actually it, it does. So, what are your thoughts on that subject? Are in general are stents effective and do statins work? And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, like a small percentage, but like the, the average person on a statin, are they being benefited by taking that statin? So the deal with the statin, I'm not a big fan of statin, so I'll be up straight with that. You know, um, Dr. Kim Williams, he goes to the data and there's data showing statins to be effective in a certain situation, but you know, I, I'm not a, and, and Dr. Brown, I'm, I'm going to ask him to chime in on the concept of this, but certainly when you look at studies, you have to look at the context of the study. And so if I if I show a benefit of a drug, uh, I say, well, that that benefit may be true, but the, the, the benefit is in a certain context. And let me give you an example of a drug, none than sad. So for instance, that's a drug that I use called Milanone. So the patient comes into uh, the the hospital uh, and they're in decompensated heart failure. They they are acidotic. Uh, their kidneys on the verge, and 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 I may give them milrinone. That drug in that context uh, it can be very beneficial. It can turn them around. It can get rid of the the acidosis, etc. And so you could probably do a study of the use of milrinone in that acute setting and show some benefit. However, uh, there was a study taken milrinone. In fact, Pfizer. Uh, took that molecule, put it in an oil form, and they tested it on the outpatient setting. So, well, this drug, and it increased the milrinone for the audience's sake, it's, it increases the heart's contractility. So it helps the heart beat stronger and it vasodilates the arteries. So it re reduces resistance to flow and, re and improves circulation. So that's a, that's a beautiful physiological uh, 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 function, a, a, a duo, if you will. However, when that drug was taken and used in the outpatient setting, uh, what they found was after around six months, there was more deaths in the middle known arm than in the placebo arm. And so what we know from that drug long term in that setting, it has an adverse effect. The reason I, I, I gave you that example is because of the following. Um, the, um, the concept of statin drugs is shown in one setting. We cannot extrapolate the use of statin drugs over the lifetime of 10, 15, 20 years of someone's life. There's, I mean, people, the body uses cholesterol for many reasons. They don't, cholesterol is not only used for making plaque in the coronary arteries. It used to heal nerves and other tissue. Uh, and so there are many benefits. And so someone may have an elevated cholesterol level because some neurological issue, there's some other biological process that we may not be aware of that the cholesterol is, is 205 instead of 150 uh, that it needs to be there. So to falsely lower cholesterol uh, it, it, in and of itself is not uh, a, a long-term benefit. So that's the, the exception I take. That's number one. Number two, the alternative approaches. So even though lowering cholesterol and the other thing statin drugs do is decrease inflammation, which is another good thing. But when we looked at our study that we published in the medical literature and, and actually Dr. Kim Williams have similar data, we can, with a plant-based diet, you reduce C-reactive protein by about 30 plus percent in just four weeks. And that's what they did it in five weeks. Uh, statin drug takes two years. So a lot of these benefits with drugs, so many drugs take a longer period of time uh, than with a natural approach. And then you're dealing with the adverse effects of liver toxicity, muscle toxicity, et cetera. So it's, it's, you're weighing the, the alleged good, which is, okay, you can show a decrease in events in this time period for using the drug, but there's a long-term adverse effect. And over time, that adverse effect catches up and supersedes the theoretical or actual benefit. So that's the case of statins. 
The case with um, stents, uh, from a long-term standpoint, as we alluded to earlier, uh, it, it can have an acute event. So um, I recall I was in the lab and planning a defibrillator, and as I was finishing up, there was a lot of commotion in the next room. They're rushing a patient in, and uh, I stepped in to see what's going on. As the patient had a cardiac arrest and the hospital was being resuscitated, again, chest compressions onto the cath lab. They didn't uh, candidate the left main, and the heart was, you saw in the silhouette, the heart was a standstill. He had an approximate left main. They got the wire crossed, stented, opened it up, doing chest compression, heart came back, and it occurred. In that situation, the stent's beneficial. And so in, in the acute setting, you can argue that stents are beneficial in patients with acute coronary syndrome, certainly in, in extreme cases like that. Uh, from elective surgery, they've done studies when you have people with elective, like angina, or an abnormal stress test, and you go and find a critical stenosis, electively it's not shown to be beneficial. So you, when you when you ask about the benefit of something, uh, you have to look at the the, the context. Uh, you know, if my house is on fire, there's a benefit in the fire trucks coming and breaking the doors down and spraying water all over the place. But if the house is not on fire, that's not a benefit. And so you always have to look at context, and, and that's the way I like to look at it. Great, thank you for that. Any thoughts, Dr. Bryan, on that subject? Yeah, look, I, I completely agree with with what he said, and it's really encouraging to see cardiologists speak this language because you know I I was brought up in the basic sciences, understanding mechanism of disease, and you know coronary disease isn't an anatomical issue. Really, it's 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 really an endothelial dysfunction. It's the dysfunctional endothelium. So placing a sin in there is not going to restore the function of an endothelial cell. So we have to get to the root cause of that. And now statins, you know, again, it's risk benefit. Um, if you look at primary prevention, secondary prevention, or tertiary prevention in the trials on statins, there's really no benefit. They'll talk about a relative risk index of, <clears throat> you know, one to two. Anything less than two is typically noise. So it's not just, it's it, really what you look at is the number to treat. And if you kind of dissect the clinical data in these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of prospective studies that they look on either primary or secondary prevention of statins, you have to treat tens of thousands of patients to prevent one event. Okay, so that's the benefit. What's the risk? Well, it's the myalgia, it's mitochondrial dysfunction, it's disrupting uh, cell signaling events, you develop insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, there's, there's now rapid onset of Alzheimer's. So if you're going to prevent one event and treating 10,000s of patients, but yet you're going to ex expose them to an increased rate of diabetes, their mitochondrial toxicants, or perhaps even uh, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, the risk-benefit quotient will not allow you in good judgment to put a patient on a stat. And as Dr. Montgomery said, you, you need cholesterol. Our body naturally makes cholesterol, right? Our body makes it because we need it. If we're not getting it from our diet, then our body has to make it. The brain is 80% cholesterol. The cell membrane that regulates in, in communication in and out of the cell is made up of cholesterol. And if you get your cholesterol below 200, you basically eliminate the fluidity of the cell membrane. You disrupt cell signaling, you develop insulin resistance, you shut down nitric oxide production. And all of these are bad things. So to me, in looking at the literature over the past 30 years, you know, statins came on the market in 1987. And the American Heart Association made a statement when <clears throat> Brown and Goldstein won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of these HMGA co-reductase inhibitors or LDL receptors that if we lowered cholesterol, you would eliminate PCIs and basically eradicate cardiovascular disease by the turn of the century. And yet, if you look at the number of PCIs per year, they've increased tenfold since the 1980s. So it's done just the opposite. And because cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease, it's really the oxidized lipoprotein particles, it's the underlying inflammation, it's elevation in triglycerides. So it's the wrong target. And that's the problem. You know, cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer of men and women worldwide, despite billions of research every year, because they're, they're chasing the wrong target. We have to get to the root cause of vascular disease, vascular biology, and restore physiology. And that's really the, the beauty of what nitric oxide does, because it restores normal endothelial function, prevents the plaque deposition, prevents the inflammation, and maintains coronary flow. And in the heart, at doses that it's produced, it's what's called a positive ionotrope. 
So not only is it dilating the coronary artery, so you're getting increasing the, the, the metabolic demands on the heart or, or serving the increased metabolic demand, but you're actually improving the pump function, the, the contractility of the heart, because it's it's an ionotrope, which means so now you're getting better ejection fraction with each heartbeat, and the coronary arteries are more dilated, so you can deliver more oxygen to that beating heart. And just to clarify something, um, you said something about going below 200 with your cholesterol. Is was that a bad thing you were saying? And if so, what, what would be the ideal uh, rate of cholesterol? Well, if you look at the Framingham Heart Study, which is the largest prospective study probably in the world, the people who live the longest have cholesterol between 240 and 260. If you get your cholesterol below 200, number one, you can't make testosterone, you can't make estrogen, you can't make vitamin D. So if you can't make vitamin D, which is a critical hormone, you become immunocompromised. You can't make testosterone or estrogen to develop erectile dysfunction or hormone imbalances. Uh, so cholesterol is the backbone where which hormone, sex hormones are made and vitamin D is made. So if you get your cholesterol below 200, not only are you disrupting cell membrane function, but patients become deficient in vitamin D, testosterone, and estrogen. So it creates this perfect cascade for making patients chronically dependent upon pharmaceuticals. So it's a beautiful business model. It's a beautiful financial model, but it's at the expense of the patient's health. Thank you. And Dr. Montgomery, your thoughts on that, on, on the, an ideal number? You know, I, and I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, we have these false numbers. And oftentimes I like to think that the ideal number is what the patient lives when in optimal health. And so okay. you put up on the optimal nutritional regimen and oftentimes that total cholesterol is over 200 or maybe it's 190 or maybe it's whatever. So, so my, my comment to that is simply you treat the patient, not the number. And so yeah. as Dr. Brian mentioned that, yeah, the cholesterol may need to be 260 because many other needs, vitamin D, maybe someone, maybe not, not getting a lot of sunshine exposure. So you need more cholesterol to predispose to more vitamin D production because you're not in a climate where there's more sunshine. There, there are a lot of reasons why you may need more cholesterol in some situations than others. 